Okay, let's get started. And a very warm welcome to our 67th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And this is where every Tuesday and Thursday, um, we come to you with a topic of importance to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today what's going on in order that we might get a better type of security tomorrow. And the topic today is one that has emerged out of previous webinars. And it's about the role of the frontline security staff. And the opportunity that this has all presented, all that's been going on in the world, presents uh, opportunity to present a new image of that frontline role. We've got a chance to rethink it. And I'm delighted and quite uh, uh, pleased to announce that uh, IFPO have sponsored this uh, webinar today. Indeed, they came to me with uh, the idea of doing it. And it's certainly something we're very, very, very pleased to be talking about. And once again, I've got three people who are at the forefront of thinking and acting in this area. And in a minute, I'll be asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'll be inviting all three to make an opening statement. Once they've done that, we'll come to you, the audience, and invite you to ask any questions that you may have. Can I ask you please to get your questions in early? Because any of you who've been on these webinars before knows we move fast. The question and answer bottom at the bottom of your screen, and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll endeavour to get your questions involved. It's going to be um, an exciting webinar, so we've got a lot of issues cropping up on this topic. So without further ado, and for that reason, let's introduce our panel. And I'll start off by going all the way over to Texas and ask you, Chuck, please say, introduce yourself. Good morning, Dr. Gill and distinguished guests and all the guests uh, that are joining us today. Looks like we have a really great crowd. For those that I have not had an opportunity to meet over the last... 40 years in the security business. My name is Chuck Andrews. I am uh, the chairman of the board of Friends of Chuck and the chief strategy officer for IFPO. I'm glad to be here today and make and, and IFPO is very happy to sponsor today's webinar. Thank you very much indeed, Chuck. We're back to the United Kingdom and let's say hello to Chris. Good afternoon, Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Chris Middleton. I'm security director for ABM UK, which is the fifth largest UK, uh, sorry, fifth largest facilities provider in the world, of which we're the UK division. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm also an advisory board member of IFPO UK. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, over to Peter. Peter, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Peter Schoenstedt and I work as a lecturer at the University of West London where I do research into private security uh, and for full disclosure I am also an advisory board member of the if for uk Thank you very much indeed. Okay so without further ado we're going to ask our panelists to make their opening statements uh, um, and Chuck who's being driven in a car in Texas uh, on a very very long drive back. Chuck your opening statement please. Uh, thank you for that caveat, Dr. Gill. And yes, I already see questions coming in. No, I am not driving. I am in the back seat and I'm wearing my seat belt. Uh, circumstances were such that thanks to technology, we can, uh, we can actually make this happen. Yes, the frontline security officer and rethinking exactly what that's gonna look like. Well, that's already happening in the United States in 2020, right? Um, with everything that's happened between COVID and protests, the frontline security officer has taken on this uh, new role and new responsibility, which is even more critical. Um, I think because of that, their status uh, and their importance and relevance as frontline personnel is becoming more and more critical um, as a result of these events that are unfolding around the world. Um, and as such, we need to make sure that training, certification, and standards, and the respect that goes with that person standing there working all day and protecting that piece of property or area or building or people or assets is getting exactly what they need. This is a great opportunity to make sure that we're getting them exactly what they need. If Poe is leading that charge in a very big way and we continue to grow in our standard certification and training in that respect. So I'm excited about talking about this today because there's great opportunity for change and it's already happening and we're, and we're seeing that, not just in the United States, but in other areas around the world. 
So as we get into this today, I hope we have some great questions, right, about what's happening in your, in your area of, of both geographically as a country uh, and uh, in different states in the United States. So that's my opening statement. Let's just get into it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it today, Mark. Thank you very much indeed, um, Chuck. So now we go to Chris. Chris, your opening statement, please. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, so with regards to where, where do I see things currently, uh, Chuck's covered off a few very salient points. So here in the UK, uh, I've seen the industry change in the 17 years that I've been involved, uh, some for the better, some for the worse, but I'd like to focus on the positives. And when COVID first came around, I saw it as a fantastic opportunity for our industry to be best represented in terms of what do we do, in addition to the things we all know we do, but gets kind of overlooked and not known until something uh, comes to the fore. So in the early stages of COVID and seeing our frontline teams, there was great recognition here in the UK. There was great uh, appreciation and awareness of what our teams were up against. Uh, there was a mutual respect uh, from members of the public, etc. As time has gone on, that's become more of a challenge and uh, the, that, that appreciation has gone. And I think in terms of where is it moving towards and, and, and where our clients and where, they, where our clients at, where our team's at, um, I know specifically talking that clients are looking for cost, re cost reduction, cost savings, uh, the use of analytical data, using cameras to see whether people are wearing face masks or not for compliance, rather than having security stood on a, a front entrance of a building to say, could you put your face mask on please to be compliant? So there's definitely a shift in the market in terms of some clients looking at technology to replace the classic man guarding. Um, and in terms of what does the industry need and where are we as a whole, uh, picking up on Chuck's point there, training is absolutely key to what we do, competency with that training and recognition of what our frontline teams are doing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Uh, so just to say to the audience, get your questions in, please question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. We're going to have a big debate about these issues. We've already got two opening statements, one from Chuck painting a rather rosy picture, another one from Chris pointing about a different reality from experience on the front line. So get your questions in and we'll debate this uh, uh, openly. Uh, final opening statement, Peter, yours please. Thank you. So the 67th Thought Leadership Seminar, that's uh, quite an accomplishment I would say, so that's kudos to you Martin and perpetuity. Uh, but I would also say that it's a testament to obviously the interest and relevance of security. So this has obviously been reflected in a number of discussions revolving around the role and responsibility of the security operative. And when you get these um, thought leadership invites, there are a few questions that are kind of incite the interest and get an idea of what this is going to be about. So what I was going to do is try to answer those questions for you. So first up is to what extent has the role of frontline security operatives changed for the better? And I don't think that there's any doubt from either civil society or the industry itself that the role and responsibilities of the security operatives has expanded significantly in both breadth and depth. It is obviously reflected also in research, numerous research pieces, including my own, to a, which to a varying degree outline the benefits and potential challenges as well as outright risks with such expansions. So in my case, particularly if there is no such uh, sufficient regulation to guarantee equity and quality, while at the same time serving both business and public interests. And I think that therein lies the answer to in what way it has changed for the better. If properly regulated, the increased ability for security operatives to contribute to the public good. So then what needs to change to enhance this role and this ability to achieve this public good? Well, my argument for quite some time has been that this, there's a, fundamentally need, a fundamental need for a regulatory you know, revival. So that's one thing, but obviously there's more to it. And lately other issues have been raised as well, including in these thought leaderships, the issue of the name or title of those that work in the frontline security. And while I wholeheartedly uh, you know, rally behind those who want to enhance the perception and image of the actual people in security, I would also want to caution against conflating a title with entitlement so that some you know, call themselves cleaners, others call themselves facility environment technicians. A new nomenclature could arguably change perceptions, but doesn't automatically change the role that underpins it. So now that leads me to the third question. What is the role of the security officer and how can recent developments lead to a broad recognition of improvements that, that lead to a sustained enhancement of image? You know, a very wide question. And here I think it's very important to understand the underpinning factors. One, what actually are the contemporary role of frontline security? And two, what are the contemporary perceptions thereof? 
Now, luckily, there are currently two equally groundbreaking projects underway that would provide some clarity to those very questions. I mean, first we have the IFPO 2020 research project that would examine the role of the security officer, something that may come back to the discussion today. And secondly, we have the perceptions project ran jointly by BSIA, SI, and the SICOM that will, as the title implies, look at the perceptions of security officers. I believe that it's this way, this empirical, evidence-based way, fact-finding missions that will be in the forefront and lead the way in both clarifying and enhancing the role of frontline security. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, let's get straight to the questions then. Uh, let me come to you, Chuck. Um, Sandy Davis has got a question uh, which along the lines of, um, there's a, currently um, issues of trust with law enforcement agencies in certain parts of the world for sure. Uh, and we've heard a lot about these. Is there an opportunity for private security there? Do you think it's got the clout to uh, um, fill any gaps? Or does it save, suffer from the same trust dimensions as uh, law enforcement does? I'll ask you for an American perspective, then come to Chris for a British one first. Chuck. Very good. Yes, yeah, so um, I'd like to say uh, that actually we did this in Houston or in Harris County, Texas. We actually designed a program. Uh, law enforcement conducted an eight hour certification program on how law enforcement and security work together. And that was the very beginning as an example um, with the Harris County Sheriff's Office where uh, actual training, so there would be an understanding and relationship building between law enforcement and private security because as we all know, uh, and you know, look, being a uniform security officer is a very thankless position. And law enforcement, you know, obviously because of the amount of training that they have and their level and position, uh, in society and enforcing laws. All that is going under this dramatic change in 2020. They're already there on the front line. So as they arrive on the scene, right, when they literally arrive on the scene, they're already there. The question is, is what do they do and how do they go about working with law enforcement as they arrive on the scene? That gap was closed through that training. And you're going to see more, you're going to see more and more of that um, happen in the United States, especially given COVID and all the processes that go through working together. Um, that trust is getting is, is going to get better, especially with certification um, that is going on and the, re the respect from law enforcement. The example being the Harris County Sheriff's Office when they did this training, there's an actual certification and designation that they wear showing that they've been trained by law enforcement know exactly what to do. We're going to see more of that. You're going to see more of that as well as an initiative being driven by IFPO um, starting in the United States. Thank you very much indeed, Chuck. Well, Chris, let me come to you because uh, Chuck can get optimistic about the United States. But as you said, in the United, K, United Kingdom, we're nowhere near that, are we? Uh, no, we're not, Martin, and um, unfortunately we're not, Chuck, but uh, again, you know, try, trying to keep things in balance and perspective uh, for our colleagues that are not aware of what happens in the UK. Uh, we, we had Operation Griffin, Project Griffin was fantastic, uh, which was counter-terrorism led, and that was the kind of the first joined up approach of the private security working with, with police, uh, police enforcement across the UK. We saw great success from that. Uh, that then kind of sort of became the, you know, became the old and, and not really a lot happened thereafter and it, it still ticks along nicely. I think in terms of the, the initial question, Martin, about, you know, where, where, do, where are we heading? Uh, we have um, other parts of the UK and, and depending on where you are, we have a thing here called the CSAS accreditation, which uh, effectively gives security officers certain powers to move people on, issue fines for uh, being drunk and disorderly or move people off for trespass. Uh, but coming back to the question, Martin, in terms of from a, an employment point of view, which I'm representing here, uh, if we have that, we are issuing constant penalty notices, engaging, doing a, a police activity. We then have to go to court and, and spend a lot of time in court giving evidence as to why that was issued. And from a client's perspective, our clients wouldn't want us having been off the shop floor in the literal sense, spending all of our time in court. So in conclusion, I don't think it's something we'll be looking to do. Yeah, interesting, Chris. Peter, can you see any optimism for uh, um, improving this here? I mean, in terms of making it more possible for law enforcement to see security as a positive working partner. Peter. 
Right. Well, first of all, this happens in other countries. Uh, for example, in Sweden, there is uh, a number of, uh, well, actually, there's a particular type of private security officer with a particular type of training that, that could be deputized by any police officer at any time, thus serving an immediate public good through, again, uh, the regulatory framework allowing such uh, collaborations to take place. Again, we're looking at something that has to obviously be uh, quality controlled, if you'd like. You have to have, um, I mean, Chuck mentioned you, you have to have certifications and you have to have a, a, a level, a least level of certainty that whatever you now are going to get holds a quality that could, you know, be represented and again, serve not only the interest of that industry and that business, but also the, the, the public good. So this happens. Peter, this sounds obvious. Why don't we just do it? What's the barrier? Well, as I said, it, it is being done. I think the uh, problem in many countries is, again, a, a question of regulation. You need to have a regulatory framework that would allow the security officers to be trained and achieve such a status and competence that they then could be approached. Well, you know, this could be opened up for the law enforcement to actually be able to deputize these people on an instant, if needed, uh, at any given time. Okay, okay. Chuck? Direct question from Simon Cham. Hits the nail on the head for me here. Can you outline very briefly, Chuck, exactly in what way the role of frontline security has changed for the better? So how has it changed for the better? Well, yeah. as a result of events that have been unfolding, again, especially in 2020, their role has come to the front line of all the media and exposure, right? So... You see all these protests going on, you see law enforcement, you see security more and more and more. And that is actually getting the word out that security has a significant role, right? Protecting people's businesses or assets. Some seen negatively, some of it seen positively, but at least it's being seen, right? That the criticality of a frontline security officer is now becoming more equally important because they're already there before law enforcement arrives, if law enforcement arrives at all under the circumstances of this defunding of law enforcement that's happening in various areas of the United States. Um, I think that's about all the input I can give on that specifically, but I think it's getting a lot more attention. That's good. Law enforcement has to force majeure work with security, and that's going to give rise to an opportunity to build that level of trust, training, and certification and standards that we've all wanted to see in the industry. Okay, Chris, surely the opposite is more true, that when we get to our recession and the economic hardship, people like you are going to be called and say we want less, not more, isn't it, Chris? It's a case as an industry, we'd love to have it, Peter, but unfortunately, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're client funded predominantly and it's our clients, unfortunately, that are saying we'd love to have more training, more competence. Uh, we, we'd love to have more boots on the ground, but unfortunately, you know, service charge, rent, et cetera, doesn't allow. And therefore, you know, savings need to be made. And the first two places they're looked at is usually facilities and its security and its cleaning. And uh, we've already seen here in the UK security officers taking on uh, additional duties of cleaners, of reception teams of different people, uh, not as a bundled service, but as one person doing two or three different roles to, to that exact point. So how there is a dilution. How do you respond to that then, Chris? What's the response? Because as a company, there's only so much you can do. As a sector, what do we look, how do we change that, uh, that perception, that image, that, that view? I think we need to come together collectively and we need, we, you know, more voices speak and, you know, we're, we're trying to change the perception of the industry for the better, not for the worse. And, you know, by potentially cutting manning levels and, and doing the things that we're doing and cutting away training from, it used to be four days, it's now only one day because of budgets. That's only gone and, you know, basically dilute all of the great work we've spent many years trying to change. So as an industry, we need to come together collectively we need to be speaking to our clients of the same voice to say, you know, we can't be making these cuts because there is a huge risk to reputation of our industry, to your business, and more importantly, to our people on the ground, which all impacts the end user, whoever they are, be it members of the public or our clients. Yeah, okay. I mean, Peter, 
again, sort of, a, um, we, we hear this quite a bit, industry needs to come together, but the truth of the matter is, Peter, there are lots of factual interests in the security sector, different associations doing great individual work, and not very many examples of a lot of them coming together to speak with uh, one voice. It seems to be a barrier, Peter. Um, do you think that's the reason why this is a challenge, or are there other ones when we could talk about frontline officer? Well, I, I, I think it, it kind of goes back to the environment in which they operate. Uh, and, and again, if, if you have a, a society in which you are, view security in a certain way, as Chris described, uh, they are given roles to do cleaning, they're doing a, a number of various things that aren't you know, really within their remit or what they're supposed to do. Uh, I think you should question the underlying reasons to why that is. Um, my answer is obviously, I mean, let's take an example. Why is it that the, that the doctor can charge as much as he do? Well, because obviously, because he has you know, years of university training, it's an evidence-based um, uh, vocation. There's a, a lot of regu regulatory frameworks that keeps whatever he does in control and controls the quality of what he does, coupled with the experience, and then you get the, your doctor's license. If it would, it would be the same story for security professionals or the equivalent thereof, obviously it would be much easier to make a claim for A, this is why they cost as much as they do. And I do not think that you should squander these uh, rather you know, useful resources on, on cleaning or getting mail and whatnot. I think again, it's, it's about the, the environment in which they operate. I think that's the fundamental issue. If that would be correct, then, then the organizations would have to, to some extent, uh, come together and you know, operate within that framework. Yeah, okay. Um, um, Chuck, to what extent, it's a question from um, Carlos Francisco, uh, and uh, this has been something I've been noticing in my engagement with the security world in recent years. There appears to be a move away from security, or at least incorporating much more customer service. That seems to be the driver of the yep. front line. Do you see this as a good thing, or is there a danger that in losing that security focus, we lose what is different about security? I'll come to Chris straight afterwards. Chuck. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I saw uh, Carlos's uh, uh, question that was a good point. He beat me uh, to the punch. So apparently, uh, yeah, look, customer service is a good thing. Um, it just enhances the value of the role, its appreciation, the credibility that goes with it, and the delivery. So the clients getting a return on investment. I liken this to what has happened in the executive protection world, right? So you have obviously security and protection of the principal, very important, but at the same time, you will pick up their bags and you will remove them from the vehicle and take them into the hotel room and do all the customer service roles that are really important. You're gonna see that with security, it should be incorporated that ambassador role, if you will, right? So I think it is a good thing. Obviously, my optimism here is prevailing today at the webinar. I, I think this is all good for the future um, and what we're going to see in security, and you're going to see more of it. It's not going to be security exclusively. It's got to have that customer service piece. Carlos, thank you for, uh, for the question. Okay, um, Chris. Do you agree? I mean, is there a danger here in getting excited about customer service? We might lose what's distinct about security. It protects. Chris? Um, I, I, I've got to say, Martin, uh, I'm a fan of it. Um, I come from a customer service background before I joined the industry. So 17 years ago, I was already looking at what can we be doing? And the, the, the term concierge mindset rings a bell. I, I was doing that sort of thing 17 years ago. And in the last sort of 12 years, I've heard people talking about let's let's go more customer centric. So the role of the security officer here in the UK is 80% customer service and 20% security on average to give our international panel a view. Um, how does our teams feel about that? A lot of them don't like it. So a lot of the, from your former uh, discussions and webinars, Martin, the former night watchmen um, don't like it and, and they have a big issue with it here in the UK and a lot of people who have been in the industry say well we're not customer service agents we're security officers so I am a fan of it I, I agree with Chuck entirely that it, it's the way forward we've got to evolve with the times and in my closing uh, sum, summary of it Martin I think what's what's needed as an industry is we need to show more emp uh, empathy uh, within the customer experience. And I think if we can get that bit right, that will go wonders for our overall recognition as a sector. What's empathy with customer experience? So as in, for, for me, we, we are known that we are 
typically standoffish as an industry. We have a stigma that's associated with security. Uh, and I think if we're able to demonstrate more empathy when dealing with customers around the challenges and the issues, and especially in COVID, that is where we're going to start to win the hearts and minds. Not by going, can't you read the sign? It says, wear a face mask. If you don't put it on, you're not coming in. Those sorts of scenarios. And hence the empathy of understanding that that person may be exempt or may have traveled 30 miles, forgot to put the uh, face mask in the car. And we're now saying, can you head 30 miles back to put a face mask on? That's the empathy element that we lack as an industry in certain cases. But surely, surely, Chris, just one follow up, Chris. Surely, surely, the reason why we lack it is because in your job at the Sharp Head, ultimately, it's about enforcing rules. Now, you can do it nicely, but you're still about enforcing rules, and uh, people don't like that. There is that, Martin, but coming back to you know, what, we're, what we stand for and what IFPO is all about is about the training and, and, the, and the education. And if we get that right and, and, and we get the competence, then we won't have these issues. But unfortunately, as we know, uh, not, not everybody is as credible when it comes to training. No, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, um, Peter, Alan Burnett's question. Are the police an ally or a, an ally or a competitor? Well, They're clearly a competitor. <laughs> right, exactly. You, you wanted to put that in, on the agenda, don't you, Martin? Uh, obviously, they're an ally. They, and, if, and if they aren't, they should be, right? There, there's no other two ways about it. Uh, security and, and police should uh, work together, form alliances, form partnerships, form ways to, again, just you know, draw from each other's competencies and strengths because there are a lot from both sides to gain from the other. So that's an easy one. Well, that's the fact. I mean, you're, you're right. There is a lot to be gained. The reality is though, the reality is though, Peter, the security sector hasn't systematically gone to law enforcement and said, look what we can do. Look how we've changed. And so by and large, old attitudes still pervade. And it's those that are undermining uh, the police sector faith in the security sector it's just it, we haven't challenged it we haven't done enough to present a different image peter yes no, I, with that i agree wholeheartedly and here i think it goes back to what i mentioned in my in my opening statement we just well when i say we i think the police in this case just don't know enough about what the private security industry is about what they do what are their roles what are the competencies and in what way could we actually find synergetic ways of coexisting and collaborating i think there's a, a lack of understanding primarily in one direction if i may be a bit bold uh, not so much uh, a, a lack of understanding about from the private security side about what the police do but more the other way around. However, that could be bridged by, you know, learning more about the roles and expanding that and enhancing the image, making slow baby steps and making progress in terms of approaching the police and collaborate with them as well. Okay, I mean, Chuck, you can point to examples, as you did, where it was all nice and rosy, but the truth is they're pockets of brilliant activity, okay, and without doubt, which set good examples, but we've got to be careful, Chuck. We don't see those pockets of activity in this sort of webinar as the norm. Surely the truth of the matter is, the reason why we're speaking about these is because they're not the norm. And therein lies the challenge. When would you agree? And Chuck, what's the route to changing that? Yeah, so let me, let me just give you a little insight of what IFPO is going to be involved in to make that change actually happen. Um, Samuelson State University, of which I am a, a student, a graduate, uh, as well as an adjunct professor, Every chief of police, just giving an example, this can happen state by state, has to go through annual training and certification. And that happens at the Law Enforcement Management Institute, Bill Blackwood at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. They have to go through a 40 hour curriculum. Um, so in order to make this change, we have to bring this to the attention to the leadership of those law enforcement agencies, i.e. chiefs of police and sheriffs, right? So making this, making the education component of getting chiefs to understand and sheriffs to understand how critical, as Peter was saying, the role of security is and incorporating that into their 40 hour training block. Um, Chuck, you've gone quiet. We've lost you, Chuck. That, that's an example of real change that can. Sorry, I'm, I'm connected. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we, we lost you just for a little bit there. So nail on head, Chuck, what's the, what okay. needs to change? So what happened, it's got to start at the top with yeah. the leader. 
Chuck, we're just losing you. Chuck, we're just losing you. So I'm going to um, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Let me go to Chris. Or, Chris, what's the what's the whether that's the International Association of Chiefs Chuck, of Police, the National we're losing you. Association. Chuck, we're losing you. So I'm going to just move to Chuck. As to that's Chris. Fine. Chris, can I ask you? We've just lost Chuck for a bit. Chris, this point about right we all we all can see the logic okay what i'd like now to, to know from you chris is that you're right on the sharp end you're managing there right at the sharp end what is it we need to do chris to bring about a change what are the headline strategic objectives do we need to think about to bring about a change in attitude from the police towards private security because from what i see it's not the police fault the private security sector hasn't presented a different story your thoughts chris yeah, and, and I've uh, I've seen previous webinars where you've highlighted this, uh, Martin, and I think, again, my, my understanding of talking to either serving police or, or, or ex-police has been very much that they don't quite understand what we do. And, uh, you know, again, it comes back to the education piece around, you know, what, what is it that we do? So quite often we the police will come and they'll support us and they'll deal post-incident or during an incident, and then that's, that's kind of the end of that collaboration until the next time. And there's really no follow-up, there's no lessons learned, there's no engagement. And I, and I know a number of my colleagues here in the UK will uh, are working towards trying to build bridges with, with, our, with our police forces. I know I certainly am. And uh, we've had some serious incidents of late here in the UK, which have been where fatalities have occurred due to the current knife crime. And it's been through forging those relationships with the police to understand what could we do more to assist them when they turn up at, you know, at one of our locations what can we do to you know, um, preserve the crime scene? What can we do in terms of assisting with cordons? What can we do in terms of various things to support the police to expedite the responses to them? And I think that's something we need to get better at, Martin. And we, again, coming back to the earlier point, we need to do it as an industry collectively, not be doing it as, as, as individual silo companies of which we are, going back to your previous point, of being quite fragmented. Yeah, what? okay. Thank, thanks, okay. Peter. Let me come to you, Peter. Um, and I'm going to come to you next, Peter, and I will, I, I will let you answer this, but I just wonder whether I could bring in something else for you, Peter. Brian Sims brings this back to the harsh realities, and Mark, Brian Sims' point is they simply aren't paid enough. You know, in the real world here, the pay of security officers has, is low across the world, uh, um, and it's an absolute inevitability that when you position a role at that level in that way, you're going to attract an image problem. It is an absolute impossibility to present it much different given that reality. Peter. Well, there's no secret that the, the, the frontline security officers are certainly not paid enough. But again, this comes back to the lack of clear competencies and training and recognition. If it was, if it would become more clear what are the competencies, what are the training that underpins these uh, officers, then obviously it could be made clear what they are paying for. It could be make a stronger case for why this costs us it does. But again, we obviously have to connect this, these certifications, these various um, competencies to something very real. It has to be tied into something. And again, my, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but it, there has to be a regulatory framework to which this is attached. Otherwise, it will just kind of float around and become very vague and subjective. But if there is a strong framework in which these operate and there's clear hierarchy of competencies and educational requirements, well then, again, the pay should be and will be uh, commensurate with those levels. If I just could elaborate on yes, Chuck's carry comments, on. Yeah, be, because he, 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 I would like to, to kind of expand my own comment through the comments of Chuck. I, I mentioned before that the police sometimes doesn't really know about the, uh, what the private security industry does and how, what the, their competencies are and how they can work together. And obviously that's true at some points, but obviously at other points it isn't. And that the chiefs, as, as, as he pointed towards, do increasingly know and want to kind of collaborate with private security industry, but then you kind of want to take it to a high level. And it's also a political question where it sometimes isn't just possible for police, regardless of how much they want and need to actually effectively collaborate with private security industry, again, due to the legal framework in which they operate, doesn't allow for these collaborations to take place. So there's a need for reform on also a political level. I just wanted to make that point. Well, okay, but Peter, you're, now you're an expert on regulation, right? So let's just uh, get this headline. There is regulation all over the world, Peter. You say that we need better regulation. We've got it all over the world. What's the problem? 
Well, it's not good enough. I mean, is this your point? Yes. <laughs> that, 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 I mean, my, 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 my point is, uh, well, A, I don't agree with that we have it all over the world. We certainly most certainly don't. Uh, there are regulatory gaps uh, all across uh, Europe where I, I have studied it mostly, but also obviously including the UK. Uh, but it's not just about uh, quantity, it's obviously about quality and making sure that there, whatever regulation there is, is you know, fit for purpose. And there, I think there's a lot to be done. But again, that has to be based on facts. It has to be based on the fact of what are the roles and responsibility currently of the security officers. If we know that, well then again, if we know that better, we can obviously enhance regulation according to those realities. But currently, there is obviously still a rather opaque nature uh, generally in terms of, certainly on a, on a political level, on what security officers actually do. Okay, let me just come back to Chad. I just want to let you finish your point, Chad, because I know you make an important point. We were just pointing, and, and this just to, to, if I could ask you to capture this, Chuck, the key things that need to change are headline strategic issues that need to change to make the private security sector more attractive to stakeholders like law enforcement. So that's got to start with law enforcement at the top, chiefs of police and sheriffs around the country. How does that happen? That's incorporated into their own training. And the example I was giving every year when I was a chief of police, we had to go through training through the Law Enforcement Management Institute of Texas, Sam Houston State University. That needs to be incorporated. To Peter's point, I am not a fan of regulatory. Um, Why? The state of Texas, which is the one of the heavily, well, I'm giving you an example, the state of Texas, uh, they, for, they just sunset a whole bunch now you don't. It didn't work. It did not work. I am not a fan of regulating because now it's force majeure. It's more of a money grab by state and federal institutions. And I think there's a better way to do that. And that starts with the training being incorporated into the heads of law enforcement. And that's something that we're going to try right here in the state of Texas. Well, as we approach them and incorporate what explaining to them who, who, what, when, where, why, and how in the private security industry and how that has to change in their own organizations with their own people has to start from the top down. Okay, okay, thank you very much indeed. I mean, some, some great point. And uh, I guess uh, there's two views. Uh, Chris, there's quite a few questions, uh, including from Mike Reddington about the protect duty and uh, uh, what difference is going to make. Chris, can I just ask you to comment on this? Because there's a few questions on this. Just say a little bit about what it is and uh, why it's important. Chris. Yeah, so with regards to the, 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 the protect duty uh, here in the UK, this follows on from the Manchester bombing arena attacks, where large uh, stadia and Olympia, etc., cetera, uh, were found short, which is current investigation that's currently happening here in the UK. And it's basically putting the emphasis on large organisations to protect people and public in large football stadiums and stadiums are places of mass gathering. Um, so there's a, there's a piece happening here in the UK in terms of trying to get legislation for this. Uh, it hasn't gone through yet, but we are leading the way. And to your point, Martin, it's something that, you know, as soon as this came about, I've been speaking to our clients here in the UK regarding this and trying to make them aware that the, that the onus is going to sit with them. It's not going to sit with the man guarding company here. Yes, we will provide and support our expertise, but ultimately our clients need to be at the forefront of this and looking at this not going, is there any way that we can avoid doing this because of cost? Um, so it's, it's a huge thing that's gonna impact our industry and I, and I am aware there are already some courses that are being developed here in the UK with regards to, to the Protect Act coming in uh, as and when it gets sign off, which we're all looking forward to. And it's an exciting time and it's much needed. Yeah, because Simon Roberts makes this point. I mean, I mean, if this goes through, Chris, this is a game changer, isn't it? I personally think so, and I think it's long overdue. And as I said earlier, I think Griffin, Griffin and Project Argos for us here in the UK is the closest we've ever had to that level of emergency preparedness and insight. Um, and th this is, this is going to be very interesting for us, and it's going to be interesting for our clients. And I hope, and it's my aim and my wish that in doing this, it will get our clients to really understand the add value even further to what we already deliver and, and really make a step up and stand out and go, this is why we need you guys. This is why we can't do without you. And that's my hope. 
Yeah, absolutely. That'll be good. OK, well, we'll watch with interest and thanks for your questions on this. I'm just going to um, ask you to be quick. Jack, uh, a question from um, uh, uh, Matthew Porcelli here. And uh, one of the points Matthew makes is about the need to boost the perception of the role of the security officer. We've got to, we've got to talk it up. We've got to start um, um, being a little bit more positive. Uh, um, I guess the question is, there are certain people in the security world who are good at this. The associations, I think, have led the way by and large, many of them. Um, Jack, what's the, why, why is that not endemic to the way we think? I mean, the, the secure frontline officer is the window to the security world. The whole security world gets judged by the public on the perception of that frontline role. It's that big a deal, really. And I'm just wondering what we do to boost that up. I mean, very headline answer, if you wouldn't mind, Chuck's running out of time. Yeah, so very quickly, right? So look, when good things happen, that needs to be shared, whether that's through social media or collateral or reward systems and recognition systems, right? Not just from the associations, the IFPOs or the ASISs of the world or the OSPAs of the world, but it has to come from public law enforcement, right? Business associations, the same ones that are the, the, the clients themselves. I think you're going to have to have much more of that in the, in the form of a formal campaign in order to do exactly what you're asking, which is giving that recognition and changing the perception that's out there. Side note, the, Chris was talking about customer service uh, earlier. I think Francisco Carlos was saying, hey, this is, is this important? Yes, it is. Because from, look, it's all about perception, right? So in, in, in this perception, uh, if you're delivering and opening that door for the customer, giving them an extra mask if necessary, right? That goes a long, Chris, right? That goes a long, long ways, both to the benefit of the client as well as the person that's walking in their building. There's my comments. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, panel, I'm just going to come to you for one final comment each, if I might. And I'm going to just say 20 seconds, please, each. It's a big question, but 20 seconds each. Uh, I'd like to know this. Uh, what is the single thing that we most need to do to change the perception of the work of the frontline officer and or to enhance that frontline officer role? So I know there's lots of things we could do. I just want to get the headline strategic issue. Chris. Uh, greater awareness of, of the positive that we do, and what we bring, uh, supported by the training and competence and sharing that with our colleagues as best practice and not holding it within and, and thinking we can't share with competitors. Yeah, a good point. I mean, that it's good well, it's competitive after all, isn't it? It's a, it's a real issue. Thank you, Chris. Peter. Right, so uh, obviously I agree with Chris on those items. I would like to add the need for knowledge and education, the skills, knowledge and behavior development and having those enhanced and sharpened uh, to fit the purpose and increasing responsibilities of the uh, contemporary food, uh, security officer. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Chuck, final comment from you, please. I am in agreement with my colleagues, Chris and Peter. Absolutely. Look, we got to get the word out using social media, right? Using uh, advertising in industry magazines, video. Obviously, video is uh, even a, a stronger content, letting people know because they don't know what they don't know. So I concur with Chris and Peter, well said. That's what, that's what we have to do. Okay, thank you very much. And well, panel, thank you so much for your comments and your insights and uh, lots of ideas uh, in there. Thank you very much indeed to the audience. I appreciate uh, IFPO for their support. I know there's a lot of good work going on IFPO. I know there's a lot of good work going on in lots of associations. There's a great initiative being led by the BSI in England looking at uh, uh, changing the image. Uh, and I know that others are doing that too. So thanks to the IFPO, I appreciate that. Um, just to say that uh, there is uh, in planning a research project, as uh, Peter mentioned, on this very issue. And if you go to ifpo.org, you can find out more about it. We haven't started yet, but it's going to be big. It's focusing on the frontline officers. Uh, that's great. And uh, in terms of outstanding performance and giving recognition, the Outstanding Security Performance Awards, I tell you, Chuck, by the Lifetime Achievement Awards in the United States a year or so back, changed his life forever. Getting an OSPO, recognizing who's really good, nominations still open in South Africa, award ceremonies are, um, coming up 24th of November, Thought Leadership 2, register, it's free of charge, it's virtual, awards, a social event, uh, Thought Leadership 24th of November.
9th of December, we've got a virtual awards ceremony of the Tackle Economic Crime Awards like no other. If you think you've seen virtual awards, you've not seen them like this, uh, uh, Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller are working all the time on it. Uh, next, uh, 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 just to say that uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, we have the launch of the Security Research Lift Report, Understanding Influences on Security as a Career Choice, 1.30 GMT. I do recommend you're here for that. One of the questions today was from Matthew Porcelli about career choice. And can I just say to you, we will be reporting tomorrow on some of the influences on career choice. And if I tell you, the findings surprise me. Some really, really big deals we're gonna to need to tackle. We'll be reporting for the very first time on security careers, a survey of the security sector, interviews with people around the world, 1.30 tomorrow, released for the first time, and you will find out where you can get a free copy. Uh, and on Thursday, what now for security recruitment? That's been going uh, uh, um, um, in a rather negative direction, hasn't it? We'll tell you more on Thursday. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your um, insight. Panel, fantastic once again. Uh, really appreciate uh, your contribution. Don't forget, tomorrow there'll be a copy of this webinar on the website. You can look at, look at it in perpetuity and also a blog which I'll be writing about uh, what they've been saying today. Uh, wherever you are in the world, I do hope you can join us tomorrow, 1.30 GMT. Uh, um, where we can uh, have another debate and another discussion. The idea of thought leadership, critique today, better type of security tomorrow, that's fundamental. Wherever you are in the world, until I see you again, stay safe.